Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's uh, really exciting to see that we're standing room only. So go East Hampton. Thank you so much for showing up. I'm Kate Rogers, and I'm the chair of the East Hampton Democratic Committee. And on behalf of our 38 members, I'd like to welcome you to the CD1 Candidate Forum. Tonight, you will meet the three candidates who are running to be the Democratic candidate for Congressional District 1 and who will defeat Lee Zeldin on November 3rd. On November 3rd. I want everyone to put that date in their phone right now. A couple of housekeeping notes. We have Anna Kessler here who is translating for the Latino community. And if anyone would like to have the event translated, I uh, would be more comfortable having it translated into Spanish. Anna has headsets uh, for that purpose. Um, I know we have a couple of state Senate candidates here. Um, Laura Ahern and Tommy John Scavone. If they would just stand up. Later in the year, we'll be doing a forum for our state Senate candidates as well, and we invite you back to get to know them. Um, also, we have uh, this uh, e evening is being filmed uh, by LTV. It'll be up on their website. It'll be on Channel 21. I believe, and also will be up on YouTube. And in our newsletter, we'll get that information out to you when that is. And you can share it with everyone that you know. A couple of housekeeping notes. The presidential primary will be on April 28, 2020. The days of early voting are April 18th through April 26th for the presidential primary. The congressional primary early voting dates are June 13th through June 21st. The primary is June 23rd, 2020. And again, the general election is on November 3rd, and early voting will be from October 24th to November 1st. Now, today Nancy Pelosi made the following statement. I can't even envision a situation where he, Mr. Trump, would be reelected. But we are not, we don't take anything for granted. As I say, we have to have our own vision for the future, but everyone knows that we must be unified to make, in making sure that he does not have a second term. And either will his most ardent supporter, Lee Zeldin, who commonly votes against our interests in favor of the presidents. I will add one more necessity to Speaker Pelosi's statement, and I firmly believe this, we need 100 participation, percent participation from you. Please sign up. We can't do it without 100% participation from every Democrat in the party this year. Every independent that feels the same way and anyone else that knows that we need to stop the tyranny that's happening now and we need to stop it today. This is our opportunity. America has done it before, but it takes participation in the political process. In 2020, it will not be enough to vote. So please sign up and volunteer to ensure the victory. There are so many opportunities to help, even if you only have one hour to volunteer. I assure you, it is important and meaningful in this fight for our American identity. Now, it is my pleasure to bring up the three Democratic candidates who have stood up and to run for office. Legislator Bridget, Flem Brid Legislator Bridget Fleming. <laughs> Carrie Gershon. <laughs> and Nancy Gora. Thank you for the warm welcome. Finally, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Andrew Strong. Andrew is a committee member, he's a human rights lawyer, he's counsel for OLA, and it is my honor to work with him on the East Hampton Democratic Committee. And now on to the forum. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, 
Kate for that introduction. Thank you to the candidates. Uh, on behalf of the East Hampton Democratic Committee, I am delighted to be here tonight uh, to hear the candidates for CD1. Uh, as Kate mentioned, the race in 2020 is extremely important. It is a watershed, watershed election for our community and for our country. So we're here tonight to have a conversation with our candidates to hear their ideas for improving our community on a local and on a national level. Now the structure of the debate tonight, uh, each candidate will be given three minutes to introduce themselves uh, to the voters. And then they will be given questions. And for each question, they will have a minute and a half to answer. And the other two candidates will then get 45, 45 seconds to uh, rebut or make a clarification. Candidates, your, your timekeepers are just, just down in the front row here. They'll be giving you uh, uh, signals um, on, on where the timing is. During the last 25 minutes of the, e of the evening, uh, we'll take questions from the audience, um, uh, which there should be note cards that are passed around um, to, to take those questions. Uh, now, before we begin, I just want to take a moment to thank the candidates for being here. Your time is valuable, and there's never enough of it. Uh, but more than that, I think campaigning uh, involves putting yourself forward in a vulnerable and a very public way. Uh, it's often thankless, but make no mistake, you carry our convictions, our hopes, and our deals forward uh, in November to make this community better. Thank you. Thank you. Second, I want to thank the audience for being here uh, and for taking time out of your day to hear these candidates. Uh, our democracy involves making informed decisions, and uh, being here is a step in that direction, and I am so um, appreciative of your time and attention tonight. So we'll try to, be, um, we'll try to use it judiciously. Um, with that said, I want to turn directly to the debate because we have a lot of material to cover in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and I want to start um, by handing it over to the candidates. And Bridget, we're going to start with you uh, for three minutes to introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And I appreciate Oh, Can I take this off and stand up? You sure can. I, I appreciate your comments about the challenges of running for office. I think Andrew speaks from experience, because you ran a spirited and terrific race with amazing results. Um, for Judge here in East Hampton Town, and we'll get him next time, Andrew. It's <laughs> here for Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> and I also want to thank, there are some elected officials in the room. I, I saw Jeff Bragman, Councilman, uh, is here. Kathy Burke-Gonzalez, I believe, is here. Councilman from T Southampton, Tommy John Schivoni. Thank you all for everything you do for our communities. Um, and I want to thank uh, Kate Rogers and the East Hampton Town Democratic Committee. I love uh, East Hampton Democrats. It's so nice to be here. There's always so much enthusiasm and things are so professionally run. I'm deeply appreciative. Um, and I thank you, Andrew, for, for uh, make, doing the questions for us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bridget Fleming. I serve on the Suffolk County Legislature. I am your uh, Suffolk County Legislator. Uh, I serve the uh, towns of East Hampton, South Hampton, Shelter Island, and a little bit of Brookhaven. And I've just been reelected to my third term in that office. Before that, I was on the Southampton Town Board for six years. And before that, stayed at home with my son when he was first born for six years as a stay-at-home mom. And then uh, prior to that, I served 10 years in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, where I was a criminal prosecutor. I did regular street, street crime. Well, I didn't do the street crimes. I prosecuted <laughs> the street crimes. Uh, particularly sex crimes, and then I was promoted to ch uh, chief of a government fraud unit. Um, this election could not be more important. We have a congressman who has increasingly attached himself to our president while issues in our uh, district go uh, un... One half means one half the time or one half minute left? I'm sorry. Okay. One and a half minutes left. Sorry. Okay. Well, I'll get it. Sorry. Um, at any rate, here we, here we stand with a Congressman Lee Zeldin who has spent more of his time um, 
defending and protecting President Trump and all his offensive policies than he does looking at issues here on Long Island. For instance, to eliminate the disastrous salt tax, uh, or to fix the disastrous elimination of the salt tax deduction on your federal uh, taxes. Whether it's climate change or affordable housing, infrastructure and public transportation, Lee Zeldin is absent. I don't know if you follow my Twitter feed, Bridget Fleming for Con at Bridget Fleming for Congress, but we're gonna tweet tomorrow about the number of tweets that Lee Zeldin has tweeted about, for instance, Adam Schiff in the last month. Can anybody guess? 26. How many times has he uh, tweeted about the salt tax deduction? Zero. How many times about so uh, Social Security or Medicaid? Zero. We need to take him on. And the person who can take him on is somebody who has a record at, in the local government that can form the co contrast, that can show this is how you represent Long Island, Lee Zeldin, not by adhering to the president. Thank you, Bridget. Terry, will you, will you go next, please? Hi, everyone. I, I'm Perry Gershon. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for hosting this uh, to the East Hampton Committee, to Andrew. And let me get started. Our country is at a crossroads. Oh. That, sorry, that's the Spanish translation. You're oh, hearing. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Our country is at a crossroads. The Trump presidency is dividing us and tearing us apart. Donald Trump didn't create the division, but he feeds off of it. And Lee Zeldin is Donald Trump's number one henchman these days. And he's given up on us, the people of Long Island. Our path to victory is to prosecute the case against Trump and, and Zeldin and to establish the priorities that we stand for as Democrats. 2018 election, I was the nominee. We made great progress. We had record turnout in a midterm election in this district for Democrats, and we need to do better. We, since that election, I have not stopped campaigning, driving home the point that people should know me and that I'm here to listen to them. I have been to community uh, outdoor street fairs, to fire department barbecues, and to we're holding a series of town halls with voters throughout this district, and I'm listening to what's on people's minds. Concerns like the cost of Long Island is too great in forcing people to move away. We need affordable housing. We need affordable health care. There are too many people who are uninsured, underinsured, can't pay for their prescription drugs, and <clears throat> can't make their co-payments. In our environment, we're on an island, we're challenged, and we have to step it up and protect our water and to fight climate change. These are national priorities, and I hear it no matter who I speak to, all over Brookhaven, talking to contractors, to union workers, to students, talking to parents, and talking to hospital workers. It's the same story. Lee Zeldin has abandoned us. He's not there. Look at his voting record, and we're going to prosecute him for that this fall. He voted against the salt tax cap relief. He wanted to keep it in place. He voted against the Congressional Prescription Drug Program just this past November. He's voted many times to repeal the Affordable Care Act, taking away coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. He's silent on the IRS ruling that's going to tax people who receive the Suffolk County septic program payments. We've got to call him out. Zeldin's loyalty is to Trump and to the corporate donors who support him. We need to make sure people know that. Our path, my path, is to continue listening to people. You know me, but you should know me better. We're holding 10 town halls in 10 months. We're going to continue to do these. We had four so far. We have one next week in quorum, and we're going to do five more. And this is how we communicate with voters. This is how we get our message across. Thanks very much. Thank you, Perry. All right, Nancy, we have three minutes. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Kate, and all of 
the East Hampton Dems, and thank you all for being here. This is really terrific and shows how important you know this election is. I am running for Congress because we deserve better. We deserve a government that's actually trying to make people's lives better. We deserve a government that's basing policy on facts and reality. Doesn't seem like so much to ask for, right? <laughs> How far we have come. Because right now, we have a president and a representative in Lee Zeldin who have their priorities so upside down and backwards, they're hurting people. Zeldin seems to think that his number one job, the most important thing he has to do, is defending a corrupt president. He's so busy on Fox News. He's been great at that. He gets on Fox News all the time, and he can tweet all the time. He's so busy doing that, he has made no progress for us on the issues that matter here, on health care, on taxes, on the environment, on issue after issue, he has failed us. We deserve better. Maybe the reason that he's been so bad at this is because he's been so busy on Fox News, he hasn't actually come to the district to listen to us. It's been almost three years since Zeldin's last town hall meeting. His office hours, are a state secret. <laughs> Only his supporters are told when and where they can find him. As somebody who, when I was teaching at Stony Brook, I used to have my office hours posted on my office door. I find this personally offensive. How can he represent us if he won't even listen to what we have to say? We deserve better, and that's why I'm running. Let me tell you a little bit about my background so you understand how I came to be here. I've been in public service my whole adult life, teaching and doing research at Stony Brook University. In my teaching, I've taught literally thousands of students in general and organic chemistry. My research is on making new materials for solar energy. And I've held a number of leadership positions at the university where I've been able to bring people together with different priorities and different points of view to find real life solutions to put things in action and make the university a better place. My favorite part, the most important part of my work at the university has been knowing that I make a difference for my students by helping them build a better future and by making the university better. But what my students need right now what we all need, what everyone in this district needs, is somebody to take down Lee Zeldin, go to Washington, and fight for them. I have lived in this district for 22 years, almost 23 now. I raised my kids here, sent them through public schools, built my career here. This district is my home. And for the people of this district, I am ready to take on Lee Zeldin, go down to Washington, and with your help, we will win. Thanks so much. Thank you, Nancy. All right, candidates, so this is gonna start the question part of our forum. There are a lot of questions to get through, um, and so we'll ask you to, to keep an eye on our timekeepers and uh, we're lenient, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to keep it within, within the bounds. Um, so, Perry, the first question is for you. Um, according to scientists at the National Centers for Environmental Information, this last January was the hottest ever recorded, topping a span of 141 years of climate records. There has never been a warmer January. The imperative to address and arrest climate change has never been more clear or more immediate. How do you make the case for urgent action in a system that requires bipartisan support for dramatic change? We need to look at climate change as both an issue for the sake of our planet, but also an economic issue. Climate change research fuels development. Climate change jobs, clean energy jobs, actually produce jobs 
here in this district and everywhere else in the country by going backward like the Trump people have done and relaxing the regulations on coal, we're not putting people to work. The statistics on coal miners working are no better now than they were when Trump became president. The technology changed. We can actually put people to work if we invest in green energy and getting off of fossil fuels. And that's a pretty good bipartisan argument. Until Donald Trump, Republicans were just as much pro-environment as Democrats were. Richard Nixon started the EPA. People forget that. So in order to get bipartisan support to fight climate change, it's not that hard if we're logical. Once this president is not in office, we should be able to move forward. It'd help if we get Mitch McConnell out. We all want to do that. But it starts at the top, and it starts here in New York One. I love to talk about how it's an economic uh, issue for everyone. It fuels jobs. And one other point, and I'd like to see us take the Green New Deal one step further and establish essentially a Manhattan Project or a Man on the Moon Project. Let's put a quick time frame as a national project to develop green energy technology so that we can actually get off fossil fuels faster and fuel the economy that way. Thank right, you. Thank you, Perry. Thank you. All right, we're going to go left to right. Nancy, you have 45 seconds to add, clarify, or rebut. Thank you. I agree with everything Perry said. We need to take urgent action, and there is an opportunity to have both economic development and environmental benefit. We must seize this. As a scientist, I have a, a unique uh, opportunity to be a credible voice on this issue. And I think we need to have science at the table. If I'm elected, I'll be the first female PhD scientist ever to serve in Congress. And I will actually, thank you, thank you. And there's only one other PhD scientist in Congress now. Science is so important to this issue. It's, I've been a member of the Union of Concerned Scientists since grad school, and we need to move this to the top of our priority list. Thank you. Thank you. Bridget. And this is a great question, and it's a question that sort of answers why I stepped up after my recent re-election to the county legislator to take on this job. I have a record that can put a lie to Lee Zeldin's claims of being a, an environmentalist. He tells us he's an environmentalist. He voted no, uh, he voted to gut the EPA funding by $500 million. He voted no on on. Uh, protecting uh, the environment by ensuring that oil companies had to regulate how much methane, which is one of the most dangerous things, uh, components in the climate change landscape out there, to in require that the oil companies restrict methane. I have a task force on community choice aggregation, and I see some folks from the sustainability uh, committee here in East Hampton who work with me. I have, whether it's pesticide reduction on Akabonic Harbor, you know, transportation solutions, or making sure that we have healthy aquaculture while respecting stakeholders who are using the waters recreationally. I know how to work across the aisle. I know how to get things done. Climate change is an existential threat. We cannot allow Lee Zeldin to claim to be an environmentalist when we know how to get the job done. Thank you, David. <laughs> Nancy, the next question is to you. Healthcare premiums have outpaced wage growth for the past 10 years while benefits have dramatically been reduced. Proposed solutions range from a single payer Medicare, Medicare for all to a marketplace system with a public option. Which health care plan would you most like to see come across your desk in Washington? And how would you convince voters to come along with you with any additional cost that it would create? Thank you. you. You forgot Lee Zeldin's option, which is just repeal all Affordable Care Act and go back to where we were. That's not my favorite. But I think it's important that we recognize how close all the Democratic options are. We are all in agreement that we need to have for every American access to high quality, affordable health care, period, full stop. 
The only question is what is the most effective and efficient way to get there as quickly as possible. From what I have learned from experts across the healthcare area when I've talked to them, it seems that the next step is to introduce the option of people buying into Medicare as the so-called public option in the marketplace that exists. We need to shore up the Affordable Care Act and we need to make sure that people can buy into, the, into Medicare or their employers can. The ultimate goal is to get everybody covered through the public option that is through Medicare. But we cannot get there from here directly. We need to start by letting people buy into, into Medicare. And I think that's going to be the first step. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to wrap around to, to Bridget next. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think as someone who's served in public office for a while now and had to work across the aisle, when I was on the Southampton Town Board, I was the only registered Democrat on the Southampton Town Board, and we did lots of great things. Um, I want to just say that we've got to bear in mind what a terrific victory the Affordable Care Act was. We can't lose sight of that. It was a huge political victory. So we have to hold on to the things that are good about the Affordable Care Act. We have to hold on to uh, protections for folks who have pre-existing conditions. We have to hold on to health care for uh, young people who are living with their families up to 26 years old. But there are things that we have to do to change the Affordable Care Act. We have to reduce premiums. We have to bring prescription drug costs down. So for instance, we need Medicare to be able to negotiate our prescription drug costs as it happens in Canada. There are ways that we can do it, but let's keep in mind, first of all, we got to win CD1, which is a purple district. And we have to make sure that we give people rational, realistic uh, ways to get from where we are right now, where healthcare is not accessible to everybody, to where it needs to be where it is. But we have to get there in a way that we have stakeholders on board. And we have to remember what a huge, huge victory for Democrats um, the Affordable Care Act was. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely, the ACA was a major step forward, and we can't give it up. And let's look at the big picture. It really is not Democrat versus Democrat. It's Democrat versus Republican. Democrats want to grow health care. They want to make health care available and affordable for everyone in this country. The Republican side, despite what they say, wants to take away the ACA. They don't care about people with pre-existing conditions because they're not offering any kind of coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. Donald Trump and Lee Zeldin say they want to cover pre-existing conditions, but they're not going to tell you how because they don't really want to do it. And that's what you have to remember first and foremost whenever we talk about health care. I have talked to so many people in various parts of the district, in Riverhead, all through the different parts of Brookhaven and even in Smithtown where it's very red and everybody cares about health care. It is the number one issue that we need to talk about because people like the advantages they've gotten and we must do better. Public option is a great idea. The others have talked about it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And coverage for prescription drugs, letting Medicare negotiate uh, directly with Big Pharma. Zeldin voted against it, Thank you, and we've Thank got you. to hold them to it. All right. Thank you, Perry. All right. So the next question goes to Bridget. Uh, there are numerous issues that require urgent attention in, in Washington. Immigrants in our community feel under assault. The effects of global warming appear, appear to be moving even quicker than the most pessimistic op, uh, estimates. The income gap is spiraling ever wider, and our middle class uh, is, is disappearing. Uh, our healthcare system is broken. Students are laboring under $1.6 trillion million of debt. School shootings continue with no movement on sensible gun control. Russians are influencing our election and our electoral process, and we've gerrymandered our election district. Are you sure you want to be? No. <laughs> um, you have a two-year two term uh, beginning uh, in November, beginning in January. Um, what two issues do you start with and why? Well, 
That's a great question, and I think part of it will depend upon what the makeup of uh, the caucus is. So, because the thing is, it is a short amount of time, and um, we need to make sure that we take action that is going to be effective. But there are a few things that need to be addressed right away. The salt tax deduction um, is, is one. Climate change is another with the Army Corps of Engineers, healthcare and gun control. Uh, but those things, we need to see what will be effective. Can I just say in the list of, of horrible things that are happening to us, I would just like, other, oh, otherwise, how was your day, Andrew? <laughs> I, I would like to just point out that I am so grateful to be here in this crowd that has so much enthusiasm. And I'm seeing this enthusiasm in, in uh, Bellport and Patchogue and Smithtown we have hope here, and that's because there is the opportunity to move forward on some of these issues. I would want to make sure that the Army Corps of Engineers is fully engaged to protect our coastlines against climate change, and that we're taking real action on climate change to reduce CO2 emissions, and you know, sort of hold back the damage that we see, that I see at the county level, that's gonna be more and more expensive over time. Um, and did I say salt? and also healthcare, we've got to deal with that. We need to keep tying our messages back to the issues that are affecting individual homeowners, individual families as they sit at their kitchen tables and try to figure out how they're gonna make it from day to day, as, because that's what's gonna make our economy vibrant over time. Thank you. Barry, 45 seconds. And Andrew just read a great list of issues that are all important priorities. And I'd like to see us get all of them done, or as many as possible. But the reality is, for us to get to where we want to be, we have to solve another problem first, which is campaign finance law. We need to fix our elections. We cannot get the people we need into office when they're answering to big pharma and big oil and not out serving the people of America. We've got to change that first and foremost, and then we can do the things that are important to us. Fixing health care, fixing the economy, attacking climate change. But first, let's make the election laws work for all of us and bring democracy back to the people. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Nancy. So I think all, that huge list is all important, and I agree with Perry about the importance of finance, election finance reform. Those bills have already been written, and now we need to get them passed. As a scientist, I think I have a unique position that I'll be able to actually work on climate change and on health care. These are issues that require technical expertise where my background and my knowledge will make me most effective. And so those are the issues that I personally plan to work on when I get to Congress. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, so our next question is going to Perry. Across Long Island, the cost of housing is far outpacing wage growth. On the East End in particular, housing costs have created an existential identity crisis. The median home price in Suffolk County is $544,000. Here in East Hampton, it's even higher. How, as a congressman, will you address the cost of living uh, in our community? As I said when I opened, one of, probably the most frequent comment I hear when talking to people is that it costs too much to live on Long Island. It's driving away young people and it's driving away seniors. Taxes are too high and we need to address that. Well, a starting place is the salt cap. We used to be able to fully deduct our property taxes. And this Congress and this president just put a ceiling on how much can be deducted. And that hurts the middle class homeowner of Long Island. And we need to do something about it and do it fast. And Lee Zeldin, just this past December, said it was more important to protect the Trump tax cuts to people who make over $500,000 than it is to protect the $100,000 earner who's paying too much in property taxes. So that's the first step to reduce costs. 
We need to invest money, though, in housing, housing infrastructure, to make the economy work better. We can't have people having to commute long distances to get to work in East Hampton. That doesn't work for people here. Locals know that. We need to address it by offering federal money and then letting the towns, the state, the community spend it. Federal government does not know how to build homes and how to build affordable housing, but they know how to fund it. That's the role of Washington, and that's what I'm looking to, to help us do. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. Nancy, you have 45 seconds. So I think Perry covered that quite well. And I hear the same thing from people throughout the district. They're worried about whether they're going to be able to afford to stay here, whether their children are going to be able to raise their children here. We need to do exactly what Perry said. We need to get rid of the salt deduction cap. We need to invest in affordable, affordable housing. And we need to work with local communities to find solutions. So bringing people to the table, one of the jobs of a representative is to bring people together and bringing people together to find solutions in the local communities to this with federal dollars behind them. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. I don't think we're doing very well on staying to our time. I'm sorry. I'm going to commit to try to do that better. Um, so um, the SALT tax is uh, number one on the list of how to help uh, homeowners and families to survive here on Long Island. Um, and, and, you know, I, we're, we're competing here tonight for your support. Um, and I want to earn your support. And one of the reasons why I think I, I will do a good job against Lee Zeldin is because of my background, because of the things that I've done, my record, I can hold him accountable for the votes that he's taken. He did vote initially against the SALT tax. He was sort of given a pass to do that, I think, by the administration. But he had voted for the continuing resolution that first put the SALT tax uh, cap into the federal tax. He then voted against a recent uh, proposal by the Long Island delegation, Swazi and King, it was Representative Pete King, the Republican, that would have raised that tax from $10,000 to $20,000. Think of your property tax. Think of the property taxes in Brookhaven. That would have solved the problem. And he refused to do that because he's sticking to the president and, and he's lost a sight of us here on Long Island. So that's Thank the you, first man. thing we have to do. Thank sorry, you. I had some more, but <laughs> I was, sorry. That's good. That's good. Thank you. I know, it's unforgiving, that, that <laughs> clock. Yeah. All right, Nancy, the next question is to you. Uh, now, there's been a range of gun control initiatives put forward by Democratic candidates in the past year. They range, range from banning certain types of assault weapons bump stocks, large caliber um, ammunition, to implementing smart technology that would require valid fingerprints to operating a firearm. As a congresswoman, what gun control measures uh, would you work to put into law to stem the epidemic of gun violence in our country? Thank you. I find it appalling that we are still in this place where we have to talk about assault weapon bans as something off in the future, when we had one before that worked, and all of the data show that effective gun safety legislation makes a difference in saving lives. Here in New York, we are lucky. We have some of the best gun safety laws in the country. And as a result, we have among the lowest per capita gun deaths in the country. We need to do for the rest of the country what we have here in New York. We need to restore the assault weapons ban. Yeah, I see you nodding. We need to put in a ban on high capacity magazines. We need to stop up the loopholes in universal background checks. These are common sense, they are extremely popular, and they should be easy. And we know, of course, the reason they're not easy is because of the NRA lobbyists. And we know that Zeldin has an A rating from the NRA for every year he's been in office, including being a co-sponsor of a law for reciprocal conceal and carry. That is, if you have the right to carry a concealed weapon in Oklahoma, 
you would have the right to carry a concealed weapon right here. It's terrifying. We need to move in the opposite direction, and I think it's a winning issue for us, as well as a morally right issue. Thank you, Nancy. Great. There's currently a bipartisan bill uh, that uh, would require effective background checks. It can pass. Over 86% of the country believes in it. And yet, because of the influence of special interests and per particularly the NRA, first, our congressman is not going to vote for it, uh, but it, it probably won't have the success of passing unless you put folks like us in those seats. We need to uh, eliminate high capacity uh, magazines. We have to eliminate, by eliminate I mean make illegal, ban assault weapons, and we need decent background checks. These things can be done, and there's plenty of, of, uh, of support for them across the board. I have a 17-year-old. He goes to school every day. They do, they do uh, active shooter drills. All these lovely interns that are working for us have active shooter drills in their schools. I was asked by the school board in Hampton Bays to review a vendor's proposal for these thick, thick metal doors, and they showed us what the metal door would look like Thank if it was shot that. with an AK-47 AK from 15 Bridget, feet. That. Thank, Thank you. you. It's horrifying. It has to be changed. This has to change. How important is it that we pass gun safety laws in this country? Well, this past week was the anniversary of the Parkland shooting, where two parents of Long Island, Long Island parents lost their children in the Parkland shooting. I was with Fred Gutenberg. We held an event uh, last year in Patchogue as part of our campaign, where we brought these issues to light. And to hear him speak, I can't do the justice that he can because he takes that issue personally. I ran for Scott Beagle in a race back in um, late September or early October. Passionate Long Islanders turning out wanting to make a difference for gun safety. We need to do it, no excuses. We need to get money out of campaign finance so that we can stop the influence of the NRA and finally pass some good laws. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. All right, so Bridget, the next question is to you and we're turning from national to more local uh, issues. Um, sea level rise is one of the most critical climate change impacts threatening CD1. The federally funded uh, Fire Island to Montauk study is projected to start placing dredged sand on our vulnerable coastal beaches next year. What will you do as Congresswoman to ensure this happens and to further address our coastal resi resiliency uh, on the East End? Coastal resiliency is one of the uh, major uh, concerns for Eastern Long Island, not only in Montauk, but certainly in Montauk but then also all the way down. We have a 1,000 miles of coastline in Suffolk County. I recently put out a bill that creates a capital project for long-term uh, proactive investment in the coastlines in order to anticipate uh, the effects of climate change, rising sea level, increased extreme weather events, the shoaling of navigation channels, loss of critical wetlands, loss of beaches. All those things are upon us. And as my friend Larry Cantwell used to say, it's going to be very expensive. Uh, so we need to take, and you, probably, you may have followed uh, the breach, on, the near breach in Hampton Bays where Tommy John Scavone serves. Um, we recently had Army Corps of Engineers come and save us, actually. Th these shouldn't be a emergency efforts. We need long-term efforts. The Montauk project is a good one. Uh, it's a difficult one because there are a lot of uh, competing stakeholders and there's no good answer when it comes to the threats to property on the coastline. But the thing that we have to remember is like in Montauk, you have this very robust Hamlet study that's underway um, that has a lot of good suggestions that stakeholders here at home are, are bought into. We need the funding, we need the aggressive uh, advocacy for the Army Corps of Engineers projects, particularly FIMP, but we also need to make sure that those projects include the very important work that's done right here at home in terms of what the, the needs and concerns of the community and the businesses and the folks who love the nature in Montauk um, are. Thank you, Bridget. 
Bridget's right. We need all of that. We especially need a congressman who's going to be care more about taking action than photo ops so that he can take credit for bringing federal money to this district. Yes, that's important, but longer term, we have to fight climate change. You don't just have to be on the coast either. If you're in East Hampton and you go by the intersection of 114 and Stephen Hand's path, you can see the effect of the water table rising. We need to take action immediately before we all have to leave, before we're all flooded and are underwater. That's the only solution to our problem that we should really be focused on. And again, you don't have to be out here in, on the East End to see it. The water table is a problem all over New York One. We must take action now. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Nancy. So, as Perry and Bridget have said, we need to take action here. We need to make sure that the, the county, the towns, the state, and our member of Congress are all working together and speaking with one voice about the importance of these projects. At the same time, if we don't do anything about climate change, it doesn't matter what we build out there. We need to stop sea level rise. And we need to do that by taking action on climate change. It's critically important. It threatens our way of life in so many ways. And coastal erosion and the loss of our coasts is one of those. Look forward to working with all of you on that. All right. Thank you. So, Perry, the next question is to you. Uh, in a January 15th, 2020 letter, the IRS ruled that Suffolk County residents must pay taxes on septic system rebates. Given the imperative to reduce nitrogen loading in our bays, this strikes many as deeply counterproductive. What, if anything, would you do from the House of Representatives to change the situation? <clears throat> Great question, and I alluded to this in my opening. We have a congressman right now who's been silent he hasn't said a word since this IRS letter came out. He was invited, he had the opportunity to join Tom Squazzi, a neighboring congressman, in a letter to the IRS demanding action. And he chose not to do it, which is him showing, Zeldin showing where his priorities are. And absolutely, we must do better, and I will do better. We need to work with the IRS to come up with a solution that either accepts what we're doing now or comes up with an alternative that won't be taxable to homeowners. The whole point of the clean septic program is to pay money, the county is paying money to incentivize people to install nitrogen eating septic systems. The money is structured to go to contractors, not to the homeowner, so that the homeowner wouldn't be taxed. This should never have been a problem, but the Republican candidate for county executive made it into an issue. He's the one who brought it to the IRS's attention and asked the question, should we do such, should this be taxable to the individual? Because he was trying to hurt Steve Ballone. Well, in exchange for that, the IRS has now screwed all of us. And we need to speak up and do something about it. And you have to wonder if Zeldin's relationship to Kennedy has anything to do with the silence here. We must do better from our elected officials. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. Nancy, you have 45 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. So, as Perry said, this is an issue which is of critical importance all over the island. We need to have proper septic with low nitrogen going into our bays. It's affecting the quality of the water in our bays. And we have a plan. The towns, the county, and the state are all working together to make this work. The federal government should be providing more funding for it in addition to what's coming from the state and the county. And we should stop this, these political games that Kennedy has started and that Zeldin has allowed to continue to figure out a way that we can make this change 
which of course benefits the homeowner, but it's there because it benefits all of us. And so they should not have to pay taxes on it. And we need to figure out a way to get that stopped. Thank you. Well, I've been on the front lines of this as a chair of the Ways and Means Committee and one of the um, members of the working group that made the first sanitary code revisions in 30 years to allow for these systems to be regulated by the county. I have been a champion for this issue. I mean, really, literally fighting on this issue. I don't know if you saw me on News 12 the other day when the, when the letter was issued, by the, or when Kennedy announced that the letter was issued with great spectacle on the radio because he actually had it for two weeks before he released it to the public, which just shows what a cynical, cynical approach it was. Um, and, and, you know, think about it. This is a Republican elected official who has decided to ask to get the IRS to tax homeowners for protecting the environment when the money has already been uh, taxed. Really a kind of a deeply, deeply cynical thing to do just to undermine a very important environmental program. I am going to look for a fix. I have people researching it right now. We, just like in the solar panels and solar incentives are exempted from federal tax, I believe it may be at the regulatory level, it may be at the legislative level, we're looking at it now, but I believe that as your Congresswoman, I have skin in this game and I believe in this program and I will work to ensure that you are not taxed when you take steps to protect our environment. Thank you, Bridget. Okay. Nancy, in a February 13th editorial, the New York Times' uh, Linda Greenhouse described a meanness that has crept into the United States. As evidence, she points to the separation of children from their parents at the border, some as young as three to four months in age, the refusal of local governments to resettle refugees into their community, and the prosecution of volunteers who place life-saving water and food along common migratory routes. In the context of such a polarized moment in our history, as our representative to Washington, D.C., what is the best way to address the cruelty that we have seen coming from this administration? Thank you. It's just heartbreaking. It's unbelievable that we see children in cages children as young as four months old separated from their parents at the border. It, it's unimaginable, except that it's there in front of our eyes. And it is a cynical effort to get votes. It, I can't describe it any other way because they have dismantled programs in Central America that were meant to handle refugees down there so that they had other options besides walking a thousand miles to our border. I don't know how we convince people who think that this is saving America, except by showing them our hearts. And some of them are unfortunately not reachable right now. But we need to start, and we need to talk about our values as Americans, what it means to be an American. My grandparents came through Ellis Island, most of them. One of my grandparents snuck ashore in Baltimore. Not legal, no papers, nobody ever asked. But we know that everybody who's here now came legally, right? It, it's just false. So we need to show them our heart, show them our values, and then we need to talk about the issues that actually affect them every day, like healthcare and the environment, and move the conversation away from these cynical political ploys. Thank you. Bridget. In 2016, when Donald Trump was elected, we all woke up every morning and sort of like, I called it the, um, it, it was like, I started, I started researching the concept of despair. Um, it's, it's like the song, Good Morning Heartache, where you wake up for 30 seconds, you think everything's okay, and then you're like, oh, it's still that. You know, I think we've had that since 2016, since actually the election, since, since the race. Um, and now, and God bless you all for being here and for being so enthusiastic, because what we offer is hope 
for a stable, humane uh, way of governing to go back to a place where we can uh, count on our leaders to follow the rule of law, to have a sense of compassion, to not enact cruelty as a policy. But I think that we can do it, but the way we do it is not to keep shaking our heads and saying it's not right, it's not right, it's not right. We have to just win the elections. We just have to take back CD1, and we can do it. Thank you, Bridget. Like most of you, I was appalled by the things Trump and his people were doing to immigrants at the border, putting children in cages. And you just can't talk about it. But having been on a stage with Zeldin in 2018, I felt the need to take this step one, one step further personally. Lisa and I went on a trip to the Arizona border last May, where we spent five days observing what was going on so that I could talk firsthand about seeing the trauma that takes place at the border. We saw a group of school children walking back from the U.S. into Mexico at about four in the afternoon without their parents. And I asked, what's going on here? And what I was told is these were kids of people who've been deported. So they're U.S. citizens. They go to school in America. Their families are forced to live on the other side of a border wall. And they must cross every day. There's something not right there. And we have to do better as Americans. And let's start there, because I dare anyone to take the other side of what I just said. It's time we make the Republican agenda on immigration, using immigrants as a pawn, stop. We are better as Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right. So, Bridget, the next question is to you. Uh, New York State has implemented a series of criminal justice reforms, ranging from prohibiting bail for most misdemeanors to sweeping changes in our speedy discovery trial, and uh, speedy discovery rules. Would you like to see similar legislation put forward on a national level? And if so, why or why not? Well, I think in Albany, the pendulum swang, swang, swung, has swung too far. Um, too far, especially on this criminal justice reform, and I'll tell you why. I'm the vice chair of the Public Safety Committee, um, and you know we talked to, and I also was a sex crimes prosecutor for many years. I've seen the violent, the, the um, damage to a person that violent crime can do, and we have to be realistic about supporting a fair system. Um, yes, the system needed reform, but to go as far as it did, from the perspective of a sex crimes prosecutor, I actually asked, I, I um, saw, joined a letter from the legislature asking Albany, and by the way, it was only the Democratic caucus that did this, asking Albany to delay or phase in the, the um, criminal justice reforms, and I'll tell you why I have a half of my time left. Um, so I'll tell you why, I, as I said, I was a sex crimes prosecutor. Imagine if you are the victim of sexual assault. And first of all, you learn that as, according to these laws, 15 days after the grand jury presentation, the offender, the, the person that you've accused of uh, sexually assaulting you, uh, will know your name, will know your address, will know your cell phone number, and Oftentimes, the judge will not have discretion to hold them for in, uh, on bail to ensure their return to court. That goes too far for me. Yes, we have to clean up the inequities in our criminal justice system, but I have asked, I've made a statement, uh, uh, you might have seen my public statement at Public Safety the other day. If you're not following me, it's Bridget Fleming for Congress.com. Um, asking once again that we use law that we ensure that our law enforcement professionals are giving real information to Albany as they start to um, as they start to uh, think about how they're going to reform this because I think everybody including our representatives and our senators recognize that it went too far cashless bail is a great idea because it's unfair that people are locked up in jail if they don't have money and can get out if they do have access to money. Let them be prosecuted and convicted first. That's the basic tenet that should govern what we're doing. Now having said that, 
there are changes that can and should be made in the New York State Bill. And it sounds like the Senate, State Senate, is working towards a compromise right now. I posted on Facebook about this about a week ago, and all of a sudden the NRCC, the Republican Congressional Committee, started a vicious press release attacking me for distorting what I said. It's an issue that's become so charged up. Lee Zeldin is trying to make this a wedge issue in Long Island, on Long Island. We can't let him do that. We have to stick to our guns and do the right thing and improve it, fix the problems, but don't scrap the idea because the idea is to step in the right direction. Thank you. Yeah, it's incredibly important we recognize that whether somebody is in jail or not should be determined by their danger to society and to themselves, not by how much money they have and whether they have money to make bail. Here, here. So we need to reform the cash bail. The bail, the reform that was put in place has some issues, but more than that, there has been a lot of misleading PR against it, taking cases that had nothing to do with cashless bail and pretending that the reason that these people were on the street was because there is no bail. We need to be very careful about how we talk about this issue and that we stick to facts and reality and not fall for the Republican dirty tricks that are everywhere. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. So we now have, it's about 8.05 uh, in the evening. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. But before we do, uh, I have one more question that I'm going to ask each of you, and you'll each have the full minute and a half to answer. Um, and that question is, what characteristic is unique to your campaign that is going to best position you to defeat Lee Zeldin? Uh, in November. And we'll start with Bridget, and we'll go right down the line. Thank you. I just want to clarify, in terms of the bail reform, um, dangerousness to society is not, a, is not a factor that you can use to determine whether someone's kept in jail. The, the judges have discretion, I'm sorry, yeah, the judges have discretion only if they're going to, the purpose of bail, those of us who've been DAs in the room, can know that it's only to return to ensure someone's return to court. So that's just, I just want to make sure people understand it's so complicated, that issue, but it's really important that we get it right. Um, with regard to, uh, to my, the, the ca components of my campaign that will make What's unique about your campaign that okay. will best position you? Okay, so unique about my campaign. So I'm the only one who served in public office. I've been in public office for almost 10 years here. I've been on the Southampton Town Board for six years. I am currently the chair of the Ways and Means Committee. I, I sit on the Veterans Committee of the County Legislature and I'm the Vice Chair of the Public Safety Committee. I am one of the authors of the Septic Improvement Program. I have worked uh, for d almost a decade now on climate change and environmental policy. I've worked for almost a decade on our local economy, understanding the needs and concerns, whether it's infrastructure, um, affordable housing, good jobs, public transportation. I've been there on the ground for all of that. So while others can talk about these issues, I can actually cite to my record, I'm still at this moment, well not at this very moment, but tomorrow morning, will be working on these issues. That is really important. The reason why it's important in this particular um, uh, race is because Lee Zeldin has lost that lodestar. He is no longer focused on our community. He's focused on Washington. I'd also like to name my endorsements because I have public, in, uh, sorry, I have endorsements, but they're telling me to stop. Um, I've been endorsed by many, many people on the local level uh, because of relationships, and maybe I'll have another chance to talk about that because I'm being waved off. You have two minutes to the end to, so you can wrap up and give okay. a closing. I'll do that. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Harry, please. A minute and a half. Yep. You know me. I ran a campaign in 2018, and I got to every nook and cranny of New York one. Since I started in 2017, I've driven almost 68,000 miles in my Chevrolet Volt, getting to know people on Long Island. I'm known on the North Fork. 
I'm known in Smithtown. I'm known throughout all of Brookhaven, whether it be Patchogue or Rocky Point or Stony Brook or Shirley. And people know me here at home on the East End, on, on the South Fork. That's the advantage I bring to this election. We're getting great turnout. I'm holding town halls where Lee Zeldin can't, isn't doing it. We're doing can, we've done four already. The last one in January, we had 120 people show up in Patchogue. And these aren't just activists or people who we've brought from the campaign. These are people responding to a postcard that says, come talk to your potential elected representative. And they want to come and ask questions. And I'm here to answer them. Because I'm in that unique position of having been the candidate last time. I've been on a stage with Lee Zeldin. I've looked him at the eye. And in the last two debates, he left whimpering. That's what I can bring to the table. We had 250 people at our campaign rollout last April. That's what I bring to the table. I'm gonna continue to meet people, I'm gonna continue to interact, and I wanna to listen to people, not just now, but once I'm elected in November. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. Nancy. So I, I've already said that if I'm elected, I'll not, I'll not only be the only, I'm not only the only scientist here, but I will be the only female PhD scientist ever in Congress. My background from Stony Brook as a teacher and scientist is unique and I think a strength for this campaign. Stony Brook is not only the largest employer in the district, it's also an engine of social and economic mobility. And every person in this district has a friend or a neighbor or a child who went through Stony Brook and whose life is better because of it. That connection to every part of this district gives me a special opportunity to have people interested and listening, whether they are activists who care about climate change or they are people who sometimes vote for Republicans and sometimes vote for Democrats and are looking to see what this is about. It's something that allows me to connect with people. We have also seen polling that shows that people trust scientists and people with scientific backgrounds more than any other candidate, whether it's lawyers, politicians, or business people, to be somebody who will actually solve their problems, especially when it comes to health care and climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Master. All right. So we're now going to turn to the portion um, that's dedicated to questions from our audience. Uh, we've received a lot of questions. Um, and so in order to stay reasonably on track, uh, we're going to ask that each of you spend one minute answering them. And so the format will change, so each of you will get a minute to respond to, to each of the questions. We'll see how far we can go. What I'm going to do with the questions that we don't have time to get to tonight is I'm going to give them to the candidates and hope that they look at them and push out answers either on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or your social media of your choice. Probably not Instagram. Okay, not, not Instagram. <laughs> not Instagram. Take pictures. Take a picture. I don't know, there, there are some, there are some I think that could do it. Yeah, yeah, all right, so anyway. Um, <laughs> all right, so the first question, transportation and infrastructure are very important to the communities on Long Island. Yeah. Andrew, who, who is? We're gonna start with Bridget and we're gonna go, we'll, we'll go down just because it's left to right. Um, transportation and infrastructure are very important to communities here on Long Island. Tell us how you can help uh, in Washington uh, support the badly needed investment in our infrastructure on, the, on CD1? It's a very uh, exciting question to answer because I authored um, legislation which created a transportation working group which I uh, chair uh, because I recognize that public transportation on Long Island is deeply dysfunctional. Uh, people, I did a like Bridget takes the bus day um, and recognize that 
nobody's on the bus unless they have to be on the bus. And that's just not the way it should be. We are, we are a coastal community. We need to be reducing climate change. We should be getting people out of their cars. If we want to keep young people here, which is something we talk about all the time, they don't want to own cars, and a lot of them can't afford it because of their um, education loans. Um, so we need to improve public transportation. One of the grave shortcomings of the county public uh, transportation system is that it is grossly underfunded. And that is from a federal and state uh, level. We, I, we were successful in getting $2 million additional dollars uh, in what they call STOA funding, which is state transportation funding, but we need much more in terms of uh, from the federal government because it's a huge lift. We are doing a micro transit pilot in the Sand Harbor area, which is super exciting because we have unique problems. We have a lot of geography and not a lot of people riding the, tr the uh, public transportation, so we got to solve those problems and we need our, our partners in the federal government to give a damn. And right now we haven't heard anything from Zeldin on it, but we've got a lot of ideas here at the local level. I'm very excited to hit the ground running on transportation when I get to, to uh, Washington. Thank you. Transportation and infrastructure, critical to everyone on Long Island. And the further out east you go, the more you see it and feel it. I had some great ideas I talked about when I first started running, like having double tracks on the Long Island Railroad coming out here, electrifying the Long Island Railroad. There's no reason we can't think big, but we need to start bringing federal money in, which means some give and take, some horse trading, some compromise, but we need to put a focus on how do we drive money into CD1 for transportation, and for infrastructure generally. And infrastructure can mean things like sewer systems. There are parts of Brookhaven in desperate need of sewer money. Lee Zeldin said when he first ran that if he doesn't bring federal money for sewer infrastructure into New York One within the end of the third term, he shouldn't run again. Well, he hasn't brought that money here. Why is he running again? That's how important infrastructure is. And we must continue to drive that point home. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. What Bridget and Perry have said drive home the point that we need federal dollars for infrastructure. Not only here, of course, but across the country, right? This was going to be Trump's bipartisan uh, wonderful thing, was the best infrastructure bill we've ever seen, right? and we have nothing. There's a desperate need here for investment, as Perry said, in sewers, in our school infrastructure, in public transportation. All of that needs to be done in collaboration with the towns, the counties, the state, with the local people to make sure that we're putting the dollars where they go. But if I'm elected, my job as your member of Congress will be to make sure that we have the resources here to put into those local initiatives to make a difference in people's lives every day. Uh, just for the sake of fairness, we're going to start with Perry next to give everyone some chance to, to think here. Okay. All of you have talked about the imperative of addressing uh, climate change. Um, in practical terms, what will be the number one priority that, that you implement, I think, uh, to address climate change? I'd like to think that we can come together as a nation and make climate change our number one priority. Again, I mentioned before, let's create a new Manhattan Project or Man on the Moon Project of investment in clean energy so that we can get off fossil fuels sooner rather than later. Let's beat the estimates that people are putting out and let's make it such a national priority that people are for it no matter where they're from. We'll put people to work, we'll get us away from oil, and we'll do it faster than anyone expects. And if we do that, we solve the problem. Could be batteries, could be solar panels, 
could be wind. Let's come up with better technology. Invest money in the research, in the R&D, and that is how we move forward faster. We're good at research in this country. We're a leader. Let's continue to be that when it comes to um, environmental policy. Thank you. Nancy. Climate change is an issue that is incredibly important to me personally. It is a major motivator for me in running. I've been a member of the Union of Concerned Scientists, as I said, for over 25 years. In order to combat climate change, we need to start by setting really ambitious targets. We should be carbon neutral by 2035. Then we need to deploy existing technologies in renewable energy, in clean buildings, in clean vehicles to reduce our carbon as quickly as possible. And we need to invest in infrastructure and in research to bring about the technologies of tomorrow that will help us not only here on Long Island and in the United States, but it, over the whole world, including in poor countries like Bangladesh and India, where they can't afford the technologies we have, but the carbon dioxide that they release affects us just as much as the stuff we do. So that's what we need in order to take meaningful, and I agree, ambitious action like a Manhattan Project to work on climate change. All right. Thank you. All right, so we're going to have time for, for two more questions. Okay. Didn't get to do oh, it. I'm sorry. Jeez. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right me <laughs> um, thank you. And uh, it's a critically important question. I think we need to uh, rejoin the Paris Accord. I think we need to restore the $500 million that was stripped from the EPA. I think we need to stop supporting a uh, director of the EPA who is himself a climate denier. Um, we, there are steps that we can take. You can applaud for that. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, um, sorry. Um, there, are, there are steps that we can take, and it's very clear. And the, the, what's clear is that um, it's night and day on this one. Um, Lee Zeldin claims to be uh, an environmentalist. He is supporting climate deniers. He is, we need to, uh, by the way, we need to restore the environmental protections uh, that were in place with regard to the production of methane from oil companies. I don't know if you saw the New York Times article where they showed the photography that showed the methane leaking from oil uh, tankers and uh, from oil tanks in, uh, in the desert in Texas. That's, you can just do that now because the protections that were once in place that would say if, you ha if you're producing this, this gas that is so dangerous that heats up the planet far more than carbon emissions, um, you can go ahead and do it without with our, our uh, holding you accountable and you know, go ahead and make your money. They, again and again and again, these Republicans are supporting special interests instead of protecting our environment. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. Let's get back in the Paris Accord and let's- Thank you. Great. Claim our rightful place once again as people who love our natural environment. Thank you, Bridget. All right, so now we're, we're, we're down to two more questions, uh, and it's going to go to, to Nancy. All right. Uh, immigration is an important issue for CD1. Lee Zeldin has taken extreme positions mirroring the Trump administration to increase deportation, separate children, uh, and here in East Hamp Hampton and across Long Island, administrative warrants signed by ICE were honored and used to put hardworking immigrants in jail without due process. This was finally stopped by courts. What steps will you take uh, to ensure that the treatment of immigrants is humane and consistent with our law? Thank you. This is, we've already touched on this, and it's incredibly important. And the treatment of our immigrants is currently is a disgrace. It is terrible. We need a culture change at ICE and at the Customs and Border Patrol. What we see is that there have been activities over and over again where there's been a dehumanization 
of refugees. So we need to change the culture. I believe that starts at the top. We need to change our president. We need to change the people in charge of Homeland Security because they are setting a tone that somehow these people are less than human. It's not acceptable. In addition, Congress needs to be a voice for all Americans and for righteous, rightful treatment of everyone. That means putting a priority on dealing with immigrants who are actually a danger, as the Obama administration did, and then finding a real, long-lasting solution for DACA and a pathway to citizenship. Thank you. Thank you. Let me first say that I, I completely and totally respect both Nancy and Perry. I think they're to be admired for stepping up. I mean, I think our nation is in peril in many ways. And, you know, to put your own effort and resources in, and it takes a lot to do this, to run for Congress. And so I applaud you both for doing it. I do think that this question kind of highlights one of the reasons why I felt like I couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore and wanted to get in it. And that is because when it comes to this question between administration administrative warrants and judicial warrants, uh, just like in so many complex issues regarding policy that's so important and, such, so, yeah, and covers such breadth, it's really important to have a sophisticated understanding and that comes only from experience. Um, and so as a member of the Public Safety Committee, I'm now the Vice Chair of the Public Safety Committee, but at the time I was just a member of the Public Safety Committee, when these questions were first being asked by Andrew and others here in the advocates, here in the, um, in the audience, um, I made it a point to do the research, to ask the tough questions. I've been known to be a pretty tough cross-examiner. And we brought the sheriff to public safety and we asked the questions, what are the legal standards that underlie the, the action of holding an individual on the order of the, of the Immigration and Customs uh, Enforcement Authorities? And we made some real progress on that. Uh, as Andrew pointed out, now we have a court a case that uh, has changed that. But you'll see time and again on the county legislature, I've been the one because of my background who's asked these tough questions. We need comprehensive immigration reform. We need, uh, but until we get there, we need champions for humanity uh, and for the rule of law asking these tough, tough questions when the opportunity presents itself. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad about the progress we've made over the last two years in Suffolk County over administrative warrants. I remember in 2018 sitting with the other congressional candidates before the primary answering questions routinely about administrative warrants and whether they should be enforced. And no, it's not that complex a question. The administrative warrant are a bogus concept. If you want a warrant, go to a judge and get a warrant. That's what. That's what judicial warrants mean. And administrative warrants are a figment of certain administrations who want to get around due process. It's great that we've made that progress. We made it because <clears throat> the county got a ruling to let them go forward. But we need to do much, much better. We need comprehensive immigration reform. We need to do it on a bipartisan basis and in such a way that gives rights to our dreamers. They are a critical part of our society here. They should not fear deportation. Children who came here as children are not US citizens but have no loyalty to any other country but America. How can they live in fear of deportation? We must do better and give them a path so they can stay here. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. All right, so we have one final question, and we will be running over a little. I hope you'll indulge, indulge us. Um, no, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> gotta go post to Instagram. It's yeah, good. Twitter. <laughs> All right. Um, and for the last question, are we back to, we're to 
Who's taking it first? I think, Bridget. I think it's Bridget, too. All right. So as Democratic nominee, how will you win votes in areas like Port Jefferson and Selden that traditionally support uh, Lee Zeldin? And I think what I'm interested in hearing from this question is uh, the East End is a, certain, is a certain demographic. How do you speak to voters um, in another demographic that uh, may be more inclined to, to support uh, the incumbent? It's a great question, and we're in this to win this, right? That's the whole point, is to find the candidate who's going to be able to beat Lee Zeldin. First of all, poor Jeff is blue. But Port Jeff Station is more purple to red. Right. But, um, but there are, I mean, 60, more than 60% of the district is Brookhaven, which is purple, without a doubt. Um, a very, another small part of um, Brookhaven, I'm sorry, of, of the district is um, Smithtown, which is bright red. Um, so th that's true, and we need to find a candidate who can appeal to um, folks across the district while holding on to our core values. And I do, that's why I'm in this race. I, be, I believe with my profile that I can do that. And I'm not the only one who believes that. A couple of days after the election, just this past November, I sat with Steve Ballone, who won countywide. Um, and we talked about his results in Brookhaven. He won Brookhaven with 53% of the vote. His opponent, John Kennedy, came from Smithtown. And he held his own there with 46% of the vote. I immediately started tapping into the resources that made that path to victory possible. It's telling me to stop, but I'd love to tell you more about it, and I'll just follow it up uh, when we're closing up. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. How do we get votes outside of just on the East End? Well, I did it last time. I got lots of votes in areas of Brookhaven that are okay for Democrats around the Stony Brook University, in Patchogue, in Bellport. But I also got votes in some of the other corridors where it's harder for Democrats to get votes. I did lose the town of Brookhaven by five points, but between Democrats and Republicans, it was break even. So we made real inroads, and we're going to continue to do that. Being well known is half the battle. Spending time with people gets your influence and your story across. They'll listen better. And that's what I've been doing. That's what I'm going to continue to do. We had our first town hall in Shirley, which is another bright red territory where Zeldin is from. And we had 70 people show up. So people are paying attention. We can make the inroads. It takes experience. It takes time. Oh, and by the way, we took the North Fork last time. We took the town of South Falls. Oh. First time a Democrat has done that in a long time. Thanks. To win this election, we do need to win Brookhaven. Brookhaven is two-thirds of the district. The only way we win is by winning in Brookhaven. And we need to win across many different socioeconomic communities, many different backgrounds. My position at Stony Brook, my connections to people throughout the district, including in every neighborhood of the district, gives me an opportunity to connect with people. It's what I do in my job with my students. The people of, that dis of those neighborhoods that you mentioned and the ones that Bridget talked about, these are my students who I have been teaching for the last 23 years. I know how to connect with them. They know that I have dedicated my life to making their lives better. And it makes a difference. Every place I go, every civic I go to, I meet people with backgrounds, connections to Stony Brook. And it is a way to open up those conversations and connect with them. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, we're gonna move now to our final part of the evening, where we're going to do our closing closing statements. Um, you get two minutes per statement. Um, it'll be the last 
section of our program tonight. Before we do, I just want to say thank you and acknowledge the audience one more time. It's 8.40 on a Monday night, and we still have people standing. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. I need to also acknowledge LTV for, for filming and for, for staying as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so two minutes. Uh, we're going to start, Bridget, with you, and we're going to go down. Um, but you have two minutes. Thanks. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming to and being so patient um, and so enthusiastic. The energy that is in the, this race already is just palpable. And I want to say, the stakes are too high not to get this right. Um, I got in the race 36 days before the ending of the last quarter. During those 36 days, I raised $240,000, and I thank many of you for that. I outpaced both the other candidates here on the stage considerably, um, even dollar for dollar, and also uh, not, I'm sorry, let's just say, uh, for the time period, um, and dollar for dollar, I, I beat um, Perry in, even the quarter. In the 36 days, we raised more money than he did in the quarter. Sorry about that, that was so awkward. But um, I do also want to say, we immediately got the endorsement of organized labor, immediately. That's because of relationships that I have. I also just got the endorsement of Long Island Congresswoman Kathleen Rice, who had me over to her home in Washington a couple of days ago with a number of other uh, New York delegation can, uh, Congress members. They know that I can win this. We know that there is an opportunity here to get rid of the Congress Congressman who is no longer paying attention to us and paying attention only to uh, the President of the United States and completely disregarding what's happening here, uh, here on Long Island. And, and I want to ask you, um, I have a few more endorsements to mention, but I just when I, when I say that how he is focused so much on the President, here's the question that we have to ask. Why, if he spends all his time currying favor with the President of the United States, can he not protect us from a full-on assault that the elimination of the salt tax deduction was? Why can he not produce for us to get FIMP started and underway? Why can he not protect our health care, protect us from uh, the things that we need here on Long Island? He doesn't represent the communities of Long Island, and he's trading that for his ability to be on Fox News and to be a, a political commentator and to protect the president. I also have the endorsement of our dear county uh, town supervisor, Peter Van Skoyek, as well as Supervisor Siller. I have four uh, village mayors and more to come. One of them is Sag Harbor Mayor Kathleen Mulcahy. Um, I think I got them, uh, but, but you know, we continue to roll because these local officials, the folks who have given us uh, funding to be, get this far, have done it because they know we need someone with an, a, a profile that is strong enough to go to battle because that's what Thank we're going to do. We're hitting the mat with Lee Zeldin, and we're going to take New York One back. Please join me. Thank you, Bridget. Perry. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming, for listening, and giving us a chance to be on stage and present our points of view. I want to give two special thank yous to people in the room who, without whose cooperation and support, I wouldn't be able to run. My wife, Lisa, and my son, Logan. It's great to have their support, and they allowed me to do this a second time. My son, Marshall, too, but he's in college at Tulane. <laughs> But here's the thing. The only endorsement that matters at the end of the day is the endorsement of the people who vote. People know me. I had 128,000 votes last time. We had 120, I'm sorry, 225 people or 250 people at our opening announcement event because people were excited to have me running again. This was a year, over a year and a half before the election. We had 125 people at our last town hall in Patchogue on a cold night in January because people know me and they want us to win this time. There's a fighting spirit in me, and I hope I showed it tonight, and that's what people respect here. As I said earlier, I was on the stage with Lee Zeldin, and I got him so mad at the last debate, he walked out at the end after being 
scolded by the moderator. That's what we need, people, a person who can get under Zeldin's skin. But before I finish, the most important thing is that we defeat Donald Trump and Lee Zeldin in November. We need to unite if we're going to do that. So whether it's me, or whether it's Bridget, or whether it's Nancy, we've got to come together as Democrats and make sure we beat Lee Zeldin. And with that, it says stop. So thank you for the night. Uh, I appreciate your attention. All right, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you all again. Thank you, Kate. Where Kate, there you are, and all of the Stampton Dems for doing this. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for being here on a Monday in February because you care enough to show up. We all have the same goal. We want to beat Lee Zeldin. And you guys, in the last two times that we've tried to beat him, you have done your part. You have shown up here on the East End. You have gotten more and more people registered to vote. You have turned out and you have voted for the Democratic candidate. That's fantastic and we need you to do it again. But to win, we also need to win in Brookhaven. We need to get more votes in Smithtown. Brookhaven is the heart of the district. My background at Stony Brook, teaching and doing research there, gives me an opportunity to connect with people throughout the district. That's why I have gotten endorsements from many political leaders in Brookhaven, including Kara Hahn, the deputy presiding officer of the county legislature. I also have the endorsement of Emily's List and of 314 Action, national groups dedicated to bringing people like me to office. We are building the campaign to win. You can see my guys over here and over there. And Chris over here is our field organizer for the East End, so if you haven't talked to Chris yet, please come and see him. He's called many of you at home already, and we would love to have your help. To win this, we need to have everyone involved. Please help us with petitioning. I hope I will earn your support. Thank you so much. All right, and with that, our program is at an end. Thank you again on behalf of the East Hampton Democratic Committee. Thank you all for coming out. We appreciate it, and we'll see you soon.